and welcome to World Talks here on TVP World with me, Ashim Kumar. Europe has just taken a historic leap in technology. The Jupiter supercomputer, inaugurated in Germany, is the continent's first exascale system capable of performing more than a quintillion calculations per second, equivalent to one million smartphones working together. Beyond its speed, it is also the world's most energy-efficient supercomputer, running entirely on renewable energy. From climate modelling to artificial intelligence training, Jupiter puts Europe on the map of global supercomputing. Joining us to explain the impact of this breakthrough is Professor Alexandra Pshegalinska. She is Vice Rector for Innovation at Kosminski University and Senior Research Associate at Harvard University. Professor, welcome to TP World and thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. So, so what's so special about this supercomputer? I mean, I was using words like quintillion, which I'd never heard before, or exa, yeah. whatever it was. Talk us through that. So a supercomputer is essentially uh, the type of computer that is able to perform uh, extremely large and complex calculations at uh, speeds that are far uh, beyond what regular uh, computers today can achieve. Uh, and I do think it's a great milestone. Uh, Europe has not had a supercomputer of that scale quite yet. Um, and its impact is going to be tremendous. Uh, first of all, in terms of technological sovereignty, we can think about our own European AI, which is a very big deal. We can think about training neural networks, training artificial intelligence models so that Europe can actually try and speed up in this technological race that currently really is um, you know, a race between the US and China. Europe has uh, usually been closing that peloton, has been that third power. But now with a supercomputer, I think those aspirations can be higher. And we can think about various other applications like uh, weather or climate modeling, or for instance, about things like drug discovery um, or physics and engineering simulations as well. So, so why, I mean, why is it so, or what is the strategic significance of this? I mean, uh, surely, uh, you know, the things that you've just mentioned, we could have done before this came online. It would just have taken us a little bit longer, wouldn't it? Well, a bit longer is a very big deal, I think. If something takes a bit longer in, you know, the realm of technology, that means you are and not really out there pioneering that race. Uh, I think what we are all observing is, uh, for instance, race uh, in terms of building the fastest artificial intelligence, the most capable artificial intelligence and its various applications. And as I was mentioning prior, the US and China were really the leaders of that race and, and Europe uh, was quite often really criticized for not being an AI superpower. So I think with a computer of that scale and size, we can actually really think seriously about European artificial intelligence that will also comply, for instance, with European regulations, with our values in Europe. And that is a very relevant thing. And on top of that, uh, think about uh, scientific innovation, right? Uh, making it possible to really um, come up with models that can uh, predict the weather globally uh, right. or set up new benchmarks for energy and efficiency. There are plenty of applications that will be relevant and would put Europe on the scene. Understood. Two questions. First of all, what took Europe so long? Why does it have to play catch up? And the second is, why aren't we, you know, why haven't we uh, be, been using that uh, supercomputing capacity from friendly countries like the US, uh, you know, to achieve, to, to get all of this information, to get all of this knowledge? Or have we? I think, um, you know, collaboration with the US uh, will still happen. And there are plenty of such collaborations happening. Uh, the American companies, big tech companies from the US are, are certainly working in Europe. They're building data centers in Europe. So that collaboration is happening. But I think 
the signals that we are getting also geopolitically are so that Europe should be building its own technological capacity, that it's high time. And these are the signals that you hear from within Europe and also from outside. So when you think about uh, what, for instance, the president of the United States, Donald J. J. Trump, has been saying, he's been mentioning that both in terms of security, cybersecurity and technology, Europe uh, should stand firmly on its own feet. So I think this is quite a relevant message. Uh, and I think uh, Europe now is trying to respond and, you know, about the length or how long it took. I, I think it's a big question, but uh, um, European endeavors uh, that are very often co-funded by public funds, uh, tend to take a bit longer. Uh, unfortunately, there are bureaucratic processes around them. Uh, but I think uh, ultimately we should be quite happy that Europe now has its own exascale machine because it's a very big deal and it will open up new possibilities for us in terms of doing research, innovations, but also that technological sovereignty that we really need in uh, times of geopolitical turbulence. Now, talk about technological sovereignty. Um, there are prototypes of made in the EU processes being used in in Jupiter uh, does that does that simply mean that we don't have to rely on countries like China for example uh, to provide us with with the processes or the raw materials to make them well so far yes we have been very much reliant on processors from the United States and from China and I think we are trying to enter that area uh, as well in a more uh, autonomous manner. So uh, I think we really need to, you know, build that capacity. And it's also important to keep talent here in Europe that is capable of building that technological capacities or even coming up with the best solutions for such exascale uh, machines. It's, it's very important that this talent doesn't go away, uh, that people who have aspirations to work in microprocessors, for instance, can stay in Europe and do relevant things here and uh, kind of, you know, um, uh, contribute to very meaningful strategic projects, strategics for uh, strategic for Europe as a whole. So I think that's all very relevant and uh, it's a good move to keep that talent in. In Europe. Now, um, in the last minute yeah. or so that we have left, Professor, uh, we've seen uh, since Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine, the huge use of hybrid warfare, including information warfare mm -hmm. uh, that is being uh, exercised by Russia. Uh, can the abilities or capabilities of the Jupiter supercomputer help Europe's defense in that regard? Well, I think so. Uh, I'm not sure if that would be the first application. I'm thinking more so about ripple effects in the automotive industry, in energy industry, and in, in the pharmaceutical industry. So over there, we'll, we might see a big difference because of the very fact that we have a supercomputer in, in Europe now. However, when it comes to AI models and the training of AI models, also for the sake of uh, cybersecurity or for reasons related to cybersecurity, protection against deep fakes, right. classifying deep fakes, uh, yeah. recognizing disinformation, I'm sure that these applications can also be very meaningful. So Understood. Uh, I think it will be a part of it. I'm sure it will be. Professor, thank you so much for sharing your insights and thank analysis you. with our audience. Have a good evening. And that brings us to the end of this episode of World Talks. Goodbye.